Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Today we're going to be studying Abraham Maimonides. Now, uh, something very, very important that Muslims need to do, and that is uh, Muslims need to have a better understanding of the social sciences. And uh, part of that, part of one of the one of the aspects of social sciences is history. And so I, you know, whenever I write in parentheses higher studies, that has to do with higher studies, meaning academic world studies, in which we're trying to relate those studies to the Quran, to Islamic history, uh, but more particularly the Quran and uh, and the coming of Islam in the world. Now, having said that, what are the subjects of the social sciences that we're interested in connecting with the Quran? So we have political science, we have sociology, we have anthropology, we have psychology, uh, we have history, we have law, um, and there might be one or two more, philosophy, okay? So we want to connect these subjects with the Qur'an and to be able to filter out the good of it and the bad of it and to take the good of it so that in the future, in the... Um, because knowledge is increasing, right? So knowledge is uh, reaching a new level. And so we can read, make new discoveries with these, this new knowledge. We can make new discoveries in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Sanurihim ayatina. We will soon show them our ayat. Fil afaq wa fi anfusihim. In the horizons and in themselves. Hatta, we will keep showing it until what? Hatta yatabayyana annahu al-haq. Until it's absolutely clear this is the truth. Right? So knowledge as it is increasing, right? And uh, uh, the Prophet sallallahu said about the Quran, لا تنقط أجائبه Its treasures will never finish. Okay? So this is the reason why it is extremely important for the next phase of the Khilafah um, that in the next phase of Khilafah, we take the highest peak of human knowledge and connect it with the deen. And that then when we are talking about hu the most basic question, what is a human being, right? Is he just an animal or something more, uh, is just a higher, for, high, a, a more highly uh, formed, evolved animal or is he something more than that? He's more than just being an animal. So these are the basic questions that need to be dealt with at a philosophical level because until you don't deal with these basic level questions uh, which were dealt in the West during the Renaissance, okay, um, until you don't have a strong philosophical base, you can't really build a strong society uh, and, 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 and take advantage of that newfound knowledge. Uh, so. It is very important to connect the Qur'an with the newfound knowledge. Now, some of this knowledge, particularly in the social sciences, is not going to be, uh, is not going to, um, is not going to fit with Qur'an and Islam very well. Uh, for example, many aspects that you'll study in the university about feminism are not going to fit with the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet But to then, the second thing to do after that is to, be able to put the things that don't fit under the Qur'an under a microscope. To be able to critique it, to be able to understand it, and to break it down so that the minds of the masses that are being brainwashed um, to think in a certain way uh, then can be uh, delivered to the right way of thinking. Um, and so then that's part of that project. What we're going to be studying today is uh, the son of Maimonides, who is considered the greatest jurist and a legal expert in the Jewish religion, his son Abraham. Now, um, Maimonides is an interesting person. We may get to him one day, but Abraham is also very, very interesting. So we're going to read a paper about him and his relationship with Islam and how he saw the Jewish relationship with Islam, how he saw these two kind of like religions uh, come together in a, in, in, a, in a symbiotic relationship. And why am I highlighting this? Because I'm highlighting this to show that how the Jewish people of the past thought versus how the Zionist movement of today is thinking, right? And so you'll see this symbiotic relationship that he talks about and, 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 and so he says a lot of interesting things that we're going to discuss. And so let me just, without um, any further um, 
and do. And then I'll be talking more about the importance of Islam and social sciences and then connecting these at the academic level. So um, let us start here. Okay. Uh, respectful rival, Abraham Monides on Islam. Okay. Uh, and so let me see if I can get this paragraph up here. I'm just going to read and explain the parts that I think need to be explained. Otherwise, I'm just going to continue. Um, Islam occupies a unique position in medieval Jewish imagination. From the 10th to through the 13th century, Islamic society was for many Jews a bastion of civilization and culture in which Jews played a vital and a trans transformative role. Yet, as members of a proud religious minority, many Jews regarded the religion of Islam with deep ambivalence. Ambivalence is, you know, there's a positive and a negative relationship together. This is uh, also something that I should talk about a little bit. Uh, why did why was there a positive relationship? Because Muslims treated the Jews right. They allowed them intellectual freedom. They allowed them to do whatever they wanted to do, as you'll see for the most part. Now, obviously, there were times where this is not true. But for the most part, it was true. It certainly wasn't um, the situation of the apartheid in Israel. Okay. Now, on the one hand, think of this. I want you to kind of like truly understand this, right? Here are a people that dress like you, look like you, eat the foods you eat, but they're of another religion. They're like just like you. Like they have their beards. We have our beards. We have our... You know, imamas, they have their skull caps. You know, they eat kosher food, we eat halal food. You see the similarity, right? So how do you deal with this? They have, they believe in one God, very strict, you know, opinion of the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Absolutely no anthropomorphism, uh, no human attributes to God. They're very clear. This is very, very similar. So how did the Jewish people deal with this? And also... There was another problem. It's because of the similarity. Because this looked just like this in, in many ways. Uh, and, and, and in the case where Islam is more powerful, uh, a lot of Jewish people found Islam very attractive. And so there had to be an intellectual understanding of, okay, how do we... And, and that's where the negativity part comes in. You know, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says uh, that be has, be the, the jealousy... Because they saw themselves in Islam. And this, you know, creates jealousy, which I'm not going to go into the, the deep psychological, you know, that you usually have a love-hate relationship with your cousins or your brothers and sisters and siblings. And so Islam started out as that, but then it becomes deep rivalry, deep hatred. Um, you know, these people believe in the same things we do. And so how do you justify this kind of like, uh, relationship, especially if you're in a Jewish community, you're a minority, and the Muslims are at large. And not only that, the intellectuals amongst the Jews are seeing that it's Islam that's helping us. Remember this, very important. It is Islam that is helping us to codify, systemize our own religion based upon the teachings of Islam. And so they saw Islam as a reflection of their true faith. But at the same time, they didn't accept it as a true faith. And this will become clear in this article as we read it, okay? So, uh, as a members of a proud religious minor minority, many Jews regarded the religion of Islam with deep ambivalence. Jews at once repudiated Islam as a legitimate faith. So they respected Islam as a, as a legitimate faith while singling it out from all others as an exponent of pure monotheism on par with its Jewish precursor. So as far as monotheism is concerned, Islam was the only one that was on par with Judaism. This is how Jews saw this in medieval times, in meaning in, in the, as what they call the medieval uh, times. As such, Islam occupied a middle position in Jewish law. Outside the divine covenant, there's no covenant so we are the people of covenant. We are the God's chosen people. But here are people, they believe in everything we believe in too. So they're outside the covenant, okay? But yet the subject of special treatment in contrast to Christianity and other religious traditions. 
On the rare occasions that it was contested, Islamic monotheism was upheld by no less an authority than Moses, him, uh, Moses, uh, Moses, uh, uh, this is the Moses that is the second most probably important person after Musa alayhi himself. Okay, so, uh, Manamudi is, uh, as a, as a subject of beyond dispute, meaning it was beyond dispute that Islam's one God is the same as the one God that the Jews believed in. Yet elsewhere, meaning uh, the, the Maimonides, okay, elsewhere denounced Islam as a prophet, prophetic forgery and a crude distortion of Jewish forebear. So on the one side, since so they had this like love-hate relationship, like you guys do everything we do, right? You guys. And then on the other side, they were they would criticize Islam, too, particularly criticism of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, being the prophet. This deep-seated ambivalence towards Islam, a leaf motif of medieval Jewish literature, is nowhere more evident than in the works of Maimonides' only son Abraham, much of whose legacy is defined by his profound engagement with the spiritual heritage of Islam. So as far as the Torah is concerned, Islam actually had a lot to do with molding the Torah into the systematic system. Like, you know how we have our fiqh, we have tahara and its rules. So the same thing. And the Jews at that time were not doing salah in the proper way. Like they weren't doing ruku, they weren't doing sujood, they weren't doing qiyam. They weren't doing a lot of things that is in their books. But then it was Abraham Maimonides who brought them back to doing the prayer according to the prophetic way, which is the way Muslims were already doing it. Now, can you imagine the effect of something like that, right? So, uh, the career of Abraham Maimonides is replete with paradox, meaning opposites. In his capacity as the head of Egyptian jury, known as Rasul Yahud in Arabic and Nagid in Hebrew, Abraham represented his community before the Muslim authorities and regulated its internal bureaucracy. What is more is, as primary rabbinic authority of his generation, Abraham supervised all matters of synagogue life and communal jurisprudence. In these capacities, Abraham served as a guardian of tradition in various forms. Yet alongside his official role, Abraham simultaneously spearheaded a movement of Jewish Piet, pietism. So he looked at the Muslim world and saw the Zuhad, the Ubad, what is traditionally known as the Sufis or the mystics, and he took from them and started bringing that into the Jewish, um, into the Jewish world. Uh, whose adherents, hedonism, uh, Hasidism, derived much of their inspiration from contemporary Islamic mysticism. By the 13th century, Sufism had developed into a spiritual network of orders and brotherhoods, each of which operated under a guidance of a recognized master or a sheikh. Rites of initiation and regimentized spiritual exercises, like regiments of spiritual exercises, uh, proliferated and would prove a powerful social for force throughout Egypt, North Africa, and Near East in the centuries that followed. Against this background, Abraham and his circle looked to the Sufi movement as a living model for spiritual renewal in their own communities. It was not the first time that Sufism had been used as a blueprint of Jewish piety in the, in the Islamic world, but Egyptian pietists, okay, meaning people that were proved both more explicit and more extensive than their own predecessors in their uh, innovation of the Sufi models. The first Jewish author to reflect Sufi influence was Balya ibn uh, Papkuda. I hope I'm saying that at least halfway right. In the half, in the half, in the second half of the 11th century. Abraham in particular did not shy away from explicit appropriations or adaptions of Sufi ritual. He actively incorporated both the outer trappings of the movement, okay, meaning 
including spiritual fellowship, guidance under a sheikh, these external aspects, um, you know, uh, discrete rituals of meditation and fasting, wearing of distinctive garments, and much of its religious vocabulary and devotional ideas. So that was brought in from the Muslim world into the Jewish world. So you could think of why were they able to do this? Because of the similarities between the two. And because they saw Muslims as a true inheritance of prophethood, but denial of Prophet Muhammad at the same time, which we'll talk about in a second. And much of its religious vocabulary and devotional ideals. But remarkable as this was, Abraham's embrace of Islamic rights did not end there. He favored a modification of synagogue ritual to include well-known symbols of Islamic prayers, most no notably prostration, kneeling, the arrangement of worshippers in an orderly ro in orderly rows. So just like the Muslims stand in sufuf, he had his people stand in sufuf, right? And this is like a major figure in Jewish, and and so. Obviously, what are the Jewish people going to do? They're going to criticize him. Like, what do you do? You just take everything Muslims do and just incorporating it into your own uh, way. And so this is his response to that that we're going to now. He favored a modification of synagogue ritual to include well-known symbols of Islamic prayer, most notably prostration, kneeling, and the arrangement of worshippers in orderly rows, rather than limit these changes to priestess circles, Abraham directed his appeal to the entire community in an effort to stimulate a spiritual revival among his uh, comrades, you can say. It is little surprise that Abraham's efforts generated a storm of controversy within the Jewish community. There was a big controversy within the Jewish community. Like, what are you doing? Just taking everything from the Muslims and adopting it yourself? Pietists were subjected to religious scrutiny both in public eye within the rabbinical courts and in the privacy of their own families. The head of the Jews, in spite of his high position, was hardly immune to criticism. Ch charges were levied that the proposed changes constituted religious innovation and brazen intimidation of Islamic worship. Like, why are you, intim are you copying Islamic worship? To these accusations, Abraham offered a powerful rebuttal. His, his changes to the synagogue ritual, he argued, were mere restoration of ancient Jewish practice that were lost over the course of exile and later adopted within the Muslim community. The religious innovation he countered lay with those who persisted in their errors and spurned what he maintained maintained were originally Jewish rites. These ruku and sujood and praying in the synagogue with rows, he said, this was originally our stuff, which then Islam took from us. As for prostration, he cautioned, be careful not to confuse a new rite with an ancient one that has been neglected, he said. This is ours. Prostration is an obligation of the law. So this has... From our perspective as Muslims, number one, they are they are like Allah says in Quran, fasting has been ordained for you like it was ordained for the people before you. Now, if the people before you forgot about it, that's a different thing. But pr prostration is one of those things that was ordained for them, but they forgot about it. And now they see Muslims do it and they see it in their books. They're like, oh, it's there. We should do it. Be careful not to confuse a new rite with an ancient one that has been neglected. Prostration is an obligation of the law and ancient custom of the people yet neglected over many years in exile. And when one is made aware of that, it is an obligation and adapts it in its practice. The deluded and ignorant, ignorant considered as religious in, innovation. Over here is an interesting point. When they went into their exile, they lost their deen, most of it, right? And then they had to, and Muslim, the Muslim civilization helped them recollect it, in a sense, okay? And so, uh, that is very, very important because uh, who is to say that they got it all back? That they were able to, they would, the other way of doing it is to, is to accept Islam. And then you would find all your original teachings in so many ways. 
Um, but you'll see how this goes. And when one is made aware of this obligation and adopts it in practice, the deluded and ignorant consider it as religious innovation. What is true of prostration in other synagogue reforms was even more so of Sufi rites. Abraham identified a range of practice prevalent among Sufis that preserved in his view the path of piety cultivated by ancient prophets. Prophecy in his conception was a state of inner illumination that was the culmination of rigorous spiritual training and moral refinement. Abraham and his circle argued that Sufism drew inspiration for its ascetic regime and discipleship from biblical prophets and asserting that these were originally an integral, integral part of Jewish tradition and must now be reappropriated by the community. A host of biblical passages were ad uh, adduced to assert that the Sufi rites from austere poverty to ragged woolen garments were among the many things transmitted to the Sufis of Islam. Okay. So the Arabic word he uses or the Hebrew word in talaqa. Okay. Abraham assert, assured his readers that the comparisons with the Sufi practice were warranted in that the Sufi initiated the, the prophets and followed their example rather than the reverse. Okay. So he's saying we, we take back from the Muslim community those things that are already in our book that we forgot. And now that we see it in practice, this helps us bring it all back. Muslim hairs of Jewish prophets. Interestingly, Abraham viewed the transfer of Jewish wisdom to the Gentiles as a fulfillment of biblical prophecy that foresaw the saints of the world drawing from Israel's spiritual heritage. This then provided the opening for Abraham to acknowledge that as for us, as for us, we've adopted the tradition from them and follow their example in the wearing of the ragged cloth and other things. It is striking that in the passages such as these, the polemical argument was not directed at Muslims or Sufis, but rather his co-religionalists, meaning he's not talking to the Muslims or others. He's arguing to his own people that we need to adapt these Islamic elements because this is how the prophets of before us, this is how they were. Abraham even appealed to his community's sense of pride, insisting that the priests were merely reappropriating what was rightfully theirs. This is ours, he's saying. Consider these marvel, marvelous traditions and grieve at how they were transformed from us to another religion, and but all disappeared from among us. In their interpretation of the verse, if you do not heed God's word, my soul shall weep out account of pride. Our sages remarked, what is the meaning on the account of our pride, namely on the account of the pride of Israel that has been taken from them and given to the nations of the world? To Israel's shame, Abraham implied it is within the Muslim community that one may now find traces of prophetic worship. It is among the Sufis, the spiritual hairs of the prophets, that one may discover the path leading to prophecy rather than among the latter's direction, uh, direct descendants. So now you have to look towards Islam to find the prophetic method, not through descendants. If there is a polemic implicitly addressed toward Islam, it is a suggestion that Sufi are more, uh, are mere repositories of prophetic wisdom rather than its originators. But what is troublesome for Abraham is not Islamic piety per se, but the very presence of such a piety in Islam. His rhetoric functions paradoxically as a kind of polemic of praise, while the true target of his critique is the internal audience to whom the book is addressed, Abraham adopted a similar approach to the religion of Islam elsewhere in his writings. What he took with one hand, he gave with the other. So on the one hand, he's criticizing his own people, but then he, at the other hand, sometimes he's also criticizing Islam. Following his father, Abraham contended that the Islamic religion is a poor imitation of Jewish example. Poor imitation. Yet they had, of course, over here, after they admit themselves they lost most of it. And they weren't even practicing what we had. But yet he has the audacity to say a poor imitation. But that's for another time. Following his father, Abraham contended that the Islamic religion is a poor imitation of the Jewish exemplar, while confirming the Islamic monotheism has remained pure and faithful to its model. 
Okay. Uh, let me go down. Praise of Islamic monotheism. With regard to specific laws, although we have no evidence that he engaged in open debates with Muslim scholars, Abraham did not hesitate to identify himself what he considered uh, considered defects due to ignorance and error. The prohibition of wine in Islamic law, because the Jews, they drank wine. Uh, the Islamic custom to pray within the precincts of bathhouse and the elaborate adornments of mosques, meaning making mosques so big and adorning them which, by the way, is criticized in Islamic tradition in the Nasus, in the text. Abraham also maintained that Torah calls for a greater level of sanctity than Islamic law, meaning we have more purity. And further commented on the prevalence of the Muslim Arab society to swear false or vain oaths, like wallahi this and wallahi, like taking Allah's name in vain kind of thing against lamenting that the Jews had been influenced by the reprehensible standards of society at large. So this was his, one of his, some of his critique of Islam. You know, it does have truth uh, in it and inheritance of the Prophet in it. It has true monotheism in it. But then, you know, then there are these things that we know that we were allowed to drink wine. We know you can't take God's name in vain. So this is kind of like how he was going. Yet what Islam lacked in individual laws, Abraham implied, it made up for in fundamentals of its faith. At times, he, his tribute to Islam was couched in a thinly veiled critique of his own co-religionists. This was evident enough in his polemical epistle against the rabbinic scholars of Montpelier, who co-signed his father's philosophy writings to the flames over matters of theology. Before chastising the French community for its own errors, he painted a rather flattering portrait of Islamic faith. An equally significant Jewish faith in the realm of Islam. In the, in the process, Abraham described Islamic worship as nothing less than a sanctification of the divine name and a fulfillment of biblical prophecy. The biblical prophecy is that other nations would take from Israel, and, and Muslims did. And, you know, he particularly references the Genesis part where you have the uh, promise of two great nations, and so one of them is Islam, he says. That's fine. And we are now taking back from them, and we're like a mirror to one another. In the rejection of anthro Homorphism is no doubt by any single Jew from east to west who dwells in the realm of Islam, meaning there's their tawheed, their oneness of God is pure, is what he's saying. Muslims themselves adopted this belief from the Jews and established their religion upon it. They rejected the foolishness and ignorance of their ancestors' idol worship, and as it is written, nations shall come to you, meaning Israel, from the corners of the earth and declare. Our ancestors have inherited lies, vanity, that is of no avail. Meaning nations will come and say, our, our fathers, before our forefathers were wrong. Israel's teachings are true, and they will take from it, and the Muslims did. It is further said by uh, another prophet, from rising of the sun to setting, my name is great upon, among the nations. And because there is worship, uh, uh, their worship is pure monotheism, scripture likened it to sacrificial rite offered for his name, it is written, and in every place incense and pure offering are brought for my name, meaning people from other nations will come. And in this case, he's referring to the Muslim nation. How, whoever differs and asserts that this creator, may he be magnified and exalted, has a physical form, is a heretic, and has no place in the world to come. So this is what Abraham Monides wrote. Maimonides. On the surface, Jews are portrayed as original bearers of prophetic religion, whose monotheistic faith served as a direct inspiration for the rise of Islam and its and its renunciation of idolatry. But despite Islam's subsidiary role as a beneficiary and imitation of its predecessors, the, its unadulterated worship of the one God has glorified the divine name from rising of the sun to its setting, an allusion to the global spread of Islam. Jews, too, are commended for their unquestioning monotheism. But just position with Islam reveals the subtext of Abraham's critique. No Jew in the land of Iraq and the countries to the east, in Syria, the Holy Land, in Egypt, and the land of the Maghrib, imposes anything but the strictest monotheism. 
Anyone who lives under Islam and ascribes a physical form to the deity would be subject to ridicule, scorn, and der der derision, even in the presence of ignoranius. Ign even idiots would see that if anyone, and especially where Islam was, Judaism was purely monotheistic. And where Jews were, where there wasn't Islam, or it was mixed in with Christianity, that Judaism began to differ. Okay, so that's an important point. But Jewish belief outside Islam is different; is a different story entirely. So Jewish belief outside Islam is a different story entirely. Abraham minced no words when describing counterfeit faith of the Jews of Montpelier, who burned their, his father's books. It stands to reason, he observed, that they would receive the support of Christians whose belief is not far removed from their own. Meaning these Jews, they are closer to the Christians than they are to us. The contrast with Christendom underscores Abraham's allegation that Islam, with its unwavering monotheism, has, has exerted a, a, salutary, a salutary influence on its Jewish minority. Meaning, because of Islam, our true Jewish faith is saved, and those people that are living outside Islam, their Jewish faith is being, uh, is being, uh, is being hurt. Islam, a milestone in universal mission of Judaism. Abraham Maimonides' approach to Islam, therefore, is dialectical and ob oblivion. He cons his considerable praise of Islamic faith, worship, and piety is the mo is the most explicit of any Judeo-Arabic author before and after his time to declare Islamic belief and prayer a glorification of divine name and Islamic piety, the direct communication of the prophetic tradition is nothing short of extraordinary. Meaning this praise that he's given Islam is extraordinary. Yet what freed him to make such pronouncements was his parallel claim. So he had another claim. So on the one side, Yes, monotheism, yes, prophetic tradition, but now he has another claim, okay? Uh, yet what freed him to make such pronouncements was his parallel claim that what is commendable in Islam was merely of Jewish origin. This is just Jewish origin, but we're just taking it back. We have seen how Abraham used this claim to censor his own people for its neglect of, of their own traditions. But as the following passage suggests, Abraham likewise believed it to be universal mission of the Jewish people to enlighten other nations and serve as a spiritual model of religious life. He writes, the aim of the law is for other nations to imitate us and follow our examples, which Muslims are doing. We're, you know, Just as the members of a nation follow the example of its spiritual leaders, you shall be unto me as a nation of priests. This is in the Bible. You will be a nation of priests. Like Kuntum Khaira Ummatin Nas, you are the best of people taken out from mankind. Because why? You enjoin the good, forbid the evil, and believe in Allah. So this is the idea that they have. The pur the purpose is neither for the law to be adapted by other nations in in full, as will be the case in the end of the days, he says, as occurs in the case of individual converts, or else it to be adopted in part. This ha has occurred in the case of one of the religions that arose after giving after the giving of Torah, which affirms the foundations of the law, such as God's unity and incorporeality. For this reason, the Torah says, Israel is my firstborn. So this is, he's quoting the Bible. Israel is my firstborn, for the firstborn takes priority over other children, if one can re refer to others as children at all. The reference to this, it's interesting because uh, in the Jewish literature, they also have the story of Yusuf, and Yusuf was the youngest, and he had the priority of the father. He had the eyes of the father. But anyway, in reference to this, scripture said, be, be faithful in its observance, for it is a sign of your wisdom and discernment in the eyes of the nations, who will learn from these statutes and declare, surely this great nation is wise and discerning people, for what nation has such upright statutes and laws? So, it's talking about its laws, how, how, you know, interesting. One strength constitutes the other's deficiency, such that the two rival rivals remain locked in a in tight embrace of mutual dependence and negation. Islam, in, in this view, is but a shadow of the Jewish forebearer, and yet 
ladder must turn to its imitator time again for inspiration. Meaning, even though they're the ones imitating us, but we have to turn to them, meaning the Muslims, to get inspiration, to get an understanding. The restoration of Israel's privileged status among the nations will come at the expense of its monotheistic rival, while the very renewal of its spiritual mission requires an ongoing engagement with Islam. In order to revive Judaism, you have to engage in Islam because they have something we don't. Much like its parallel struggle with Christianity, the ascendancy of one entails the diminishment of the other, both religiously and politically. Ironically, despite the unequal status and occasional harassment experienced by Jews under Islam, Abraham believed in the possibility of spiritual renewal precisely because of the extensive religious freedoms granted to the Jewish communities under Islamic law. For Abraham Monides, the temporal and spiritual ascent of Islam and its eventual demise are instrictly bound up in the fate of Israel. So he, they had this view that Islam would go up that's kind of like imitating us and it would come down and when it comes down Israel would go up. So they had this view too. In his interpretation of the prophetic verses, verses, verses in Genesis regarding Abraham's progeny he accounted for the rise of a rival monotheistic religion as a fulfillment of divine blessing to Ishmael the beginning of which corresponds with Judaism and diminished state in st uh, diminished state in exile during a period of Israel's weakness on the account of its sins. By the same token, Israel's redemption will ensure the descendants of Ishmael and Ashu or Ishu will in turn subdue themselves to the former subjects. So he sees that Islam, Islam is on the uh, right path. Islam is on the right path and, you know, Islam is going up and, and Israel is down. But as Islam goes down, Israel will go up. So they kind of like saw this. Okay. Uh, by the same token, is, uh, Israel's redemption will ensue when the descendants of Ismail and Ushu will in turn subdue themselves or Ishu will subdue themselves in the former, uh, uh, to their former subjects. And you shall master, you shall be masters over your brothers. So then the Jews will be the masters over their brothers. And when you come to sole beneficiary of the Abrahamic blessings to the exclusion of the others, the new order envisioned by Abraham was as much political reversal, meaning political reversal where Islam is on top and Jews are in the bottom, a political reversal as a spiritual one in which widespread conversion and submission to the religion of Israel would follow. Okay. In the meantime, before the unfolding of the anticipated redemption, Judaism remained firmly within the embrace of Islam. In Abraham's paradoxical vision, the only hope for the, in, uh, the ultimate restoration and revival of Israel lay in its ability to draw strength from the very embrace by modeling its spiritual transformation on the living example of Islam. So that, there you go. So that is uh, the thing to think about um, and my question for you in the comment section is that what do you think about this and what do you think about this relationship between Bani Israel and the or the Ummah of Bani Israel and the Ummah of Muhammad وسلم, being kind of like mirror images in a sense to one another um, and what other things should we consider about this and what do you think about the eschatological aspect of this that they had this idea in mind that Islam declines Everything declines. As Islam declines, Israel would be on top. What do you think about that? So those are my two comments. And what other insights you have from this reading, uh, please share it with me. Um, but I think it's a pretty profound uh, piece of article from many perspectives. Uh, but in this is also uh, behind it kind of like a validation of Islam, right? Uh, they know uh, they know this is the prophet like they know their own son this is what the Quran says they know this is the truth like their own son um, but uh, there is a denial there but an acceptance at the same time we need Islam to see what we need to pray like and fast like and how we should do our congregation and our prayers but uh, there was an insistence that politically things need to be reversed. So I'll just leave it at that for now.
Thank you. Make sure to subscribe today and make sure you like and make sure you leave your comments and ideas. Shadow Allah.